So who's ready for chapter two of Little House in the Big Woods? <clears throat> we are going to go ahead and get started. So remember in the last chapter was all about the food preparation and being ready for winter, right? So this chapter is called Winter Days and Winter Nights. The first snow came and the bitter cold. Every morning, Pa took his gun and his traps and was gone all day in the big woods, setting the small traps for muskrats and mink along the creeks, the middle-sized traps for foxes and wolves in the woods. He set out the big bear traps, hoping to get a fat bear before they all went into their dens for the winter. One morning, he came back, took the horses and sled and hurried away again. He had shot a bear. Laura and Mary jumped up and down and clapped their hands. They were so glad. Mary shouted, I want the drumstick. I want the drumstick. Mary did not know how big a bear's drumstick is. When Pa came back, he had both a bear and a pig in the wagon. He'd been going through the woods with a big bear trap in his hands and the gun on his shoulder when he walked around a big pine tree covered with snow and the bear was behind the tree. The bear had just killed the pig and was picking it up to eat it. Pa said the bear was standing up on its hind legs, holding the pig in its paws, just as though they were hands. Pa shot the bear, and there was no way of knowing where the pig came from, nor whose pig it was. So I just brought it home. I brought home the bacon, Pa said. There was plenty of fresh meat to last for a long time. Here's a picture of Pa shooting on the other side of that tree, the bear holding the pig. The days and nights were so cold that the pork in a box and the bear meat hanging in the little shed outside the back door were solidly frozen and did not thaw. When Ma wanted fresh meat for dinner, Pa took the ax and cut off a chunk of frozen bear meat or pork. But the sausage balls or the salt pork or the smoked hams and the venison, Ma could get for herself from the shed or the attic. The snow kept coming till it was drifted and banked outside the house. It was <clears throat> in the mornings, the window panes were covered with frost in beautiful pictures of trees and flowers and fairies. Ma said that Jack Frost came in the night and made the pictures while everyone was asleep. Laura thought that Jack Frost was a little man, all snowy white, wearing a glittering white pointed cap and soft white knee boots made of deerskin. His coat was white and his mittens were white and he did not carry a gun on his back, but in his hands, he had shining sharp tools with which he carved the pictures. Laura and Mary were allowed to take Ma's thimble and make pretty patterns of circles in the frost on the glass, but they never spoiled the pictures that Jack Frost had made in the night. Have you ever seen the frost on the windows at your house and wanted to see pictures in the middle of the frost? Fun. When they put their mouths close to the pane and blew their breath on it, the white frost melted and rain in drops down the glass and ran in drops down the glass. Then they could see the drifts of snow outdoors and the great trees standing bare and black, making thin blue shadows on the white snow. Laura and Mary helped Ma with the work. Every morning there were dishes to wipe. Mary wiped more of them than Laura because she was bigger, but Laura always wiped carefully in her, her own little cup and plate. By the time the dishes were all wiped and set away, the trundle bed was aired then, standing one on each side, Laura and Mary straightened the covers, tucked them in well at the foot and the sides, plumped up the pillows, and put them in place. Then Ma pushed the trundle bed into its place under the big bed. After this was done, Ma began the work that began, that belonged to that day. Each day had its own proper work. Ma used to say, wash on Monday, iron on Tuesday, mend on Wednesday, churn on Thursday clean on Friday, bake on Saturday, rest on Sunday. Laura liked the churning and the baking days best of all the week. In winter, the cream was not yellow as it was in summer. The butter churned from it was white and not so pretty. Ma liked everything on her table to be pretty. So in the winter time, she colored the butter. After she had put the cream in the tall crockery churn and set it near the stove to warm, she washed and scraped a long orange colored carrot. Then she grated it on the bottom of the old leaky tin pan that Pa had punched full of nail holes for her. 
That was her, like her cheese grater or a grater. Ma rubbed the carrot across the roughness until she had rubbed it all through the holes. And when she lifted up the pan, there was a soft, juicy mound of grated carrot. She put this in a little pan of milk on the stove, and when the milk was hot, she poured milk and carrot into a cloth bag. Then she squeezed the bright yellow milk into the churn, where it colored all the cream. Now the butter would be yellow. Laura and Mary were allowed to eat the carrot after the milk had been squeezed out. Mary thought she ought to have the larger share because she was older, and Laura said she should have it because she was littler. But Ma said they must divide it evenly. It was very good. When the cream was ready, Ma scalded the long wooden churn dash, put it in the churn, and dropped the wooden churn cover over it. The churn cover had a little round hole in the middle, and Ma moved the dash up and down, up and down through the hole. She churned for a long time. Mary could sometimes churn while Ma rested, but the dash was too heavy for Laura. Here's a picture of Mary. And this is where all the cream was. And that's the dash that they would push up and down and up and down. At first, the splashes of cream showed thick and smooth around the little hole. After a long time, they began to look grainy. Then Ma turned more slowly and on the dash, there began to appear tiny grains of yellow butter. When Ma took off the churn cover, there was the butter in a golden lump drowning in the buttermilk. Then Ma took out the lump with a wooden paddle into a wooden bowl, and she washed it many times in cold water, turning it over and over and working it with the paddle until the water ran clear. After that, she salted it. Now came the best part of the churning. Ma molded the butter. On the loose bottom of the wooden butter mold was carved the picture of a strawberry with two strawberry leaves. With the paddle, Ma packed butter tightly into the mold until it was full. Then she turned it upside down over a plate and pushed on the handle of the loose bottom. The little firm pat of golden butter came out with the strawberry and its leaves molded on top. Laura and Mary watched breathless, one on each side of Ma, while the golden little butter pats, each with its strawberry on the top, dropped onto the plate as Ma put all the butter through the mold. Then Ma gave them each a drink of good fresh buttermilk. On Saturdays when Ma made the bread, they each had a little piece of dough to make a little loaf. They might have had a bit of cookie dough too to make little cookies and once Laura even made a pie in her patty pan. After the day's work was done, Ma sometimes cut paper dolls for them. She cut the dolls out of stiff white paper and drew the faces with a pencil. Then from bits of colored paper, she cut dresses and hats, ribbons and laces so that Laura and Mary could dress their dolls beautifully. But the best time of all was at night when Pa came home. He would come in from his tramping through the snowy woods with tiny icicles hanging on the end of his mustaches. He would hang his gun on the wall over the door, throw off his fur cap and coat and mittens and call, where's my little half pint of sweet cider half drunk up? That was Laura because she was small. Laura and Mary would climb to run to climb on his knees and sit there while he warmed himself by the fire. Then he would put on his coat and cap and mittens again and go out to do the chores and bring in plenty of wood for the fire. Sometimes when Pa had walked his trap lines quickly because the traps were empty or when he had gone to get some game sooner than usual, <clears throat> he would come home early. Then he would have time to play with Laura and Mary. One game they loved was called Mad Dog. Pa would run his fingers through his thick brown hair, standing it up, all up on end. Then he dropped on all fours and growling, he chased Laura and Mary all around the room, trying to get them concerned, where, cornered where they couldn't get away. They were quick at dodging and running, but once he caught them against the wood box behind the stove, they couldn't get past Pa and there was no other way out. Then Pa growled so terribly, his hair was so wild and his eyes so fierce, that it all seemed real. Mary was so frightened that she could not move. But as Pa came nearer, Laura screamed, and with a wild leap and a scramble, she went over the wood box, dragging Mary with her. And at once, there was no mad dog at all. There was only Pa standing there with his blue eyes shining, looking at Laura. Well, he said to her, you're only a little half pint of cider half drunk up, but by jinx, you're as strong as a little French horse. You shouldn't frighten the children so, Charles, Ma said. Look how big their eyes are. 
Pa looked, and then he took down his fiddle, and he began to play and sing. <laughs> Here's a picture of Pa on all fours playing Mad Dog. And there are the girls hiding in the corner, <laughs> so scared and frightened. Yankee Doodle went to town. He wore his striped trousers. He swore he couldn't see the town. There were so many houses. Laura and Mary forgot all about the mad dog. And there he saw some great big guns, big as a log of maple. And every time they turned him round, it took two yoke of cattle. And every time they fired him off, it took a horn of powder. It made a noise like father's gun, only a nation louder. Pa was keeping time with his foot, and Laura clapped her hands to the music when he sang. And I'll sing Yankee Doodly Doo, and I'll sing Yankee Doodle, and I'll sing Yankee Doodly Doo, and I'll sing Yankee Doodle. All alone in the big, in the wild big woods, and the snow and the cold and the little log house was warm and snug and cozy. Pa and Ma and Mary and Laura and baby Carrie were comfortable and happy there, especially at night. Then the fire was shining on the hearth, the cold and the dark, and the wild beasts were all shut out. And Jack the Brindle Bulldog and Black Susan the Cat lay blinking at the flames in the fireplace. Ma sat in her rocking chair, sewing by the lamp, the light of the lamp on the table. The lamp was bright and shiny. There was salt in the bottom of its glass bowl with kerosene to keep the kerosene from exploding. And there were bits of red flannel among the salt to make it pretty. It was pretty. Laura loved to look at the lamp with its glass chimney so clean and sparkling, its yellow flame burning so steadily, and its bowl of clear kerosene colored red by the bits of flannel. She loved to look at the fire in the fireplace, flickering and changing all the time, burning yellow and red and sometimes green above the logs and hovering blue over the golden and ruby coals. And then Pa told stories. When Laura and Mary begged him for a story, he would take them on his knees and tickle their faces with his long whiskers until they laughed aloud. His eyes were blue and merry. One night, Pa looked at Black Susan, stretching herself before the fire and running her claws out and in. And he said, do you know that a panther is a cat? A great big wild cat? No, said Laura. Well, it is, said Pa. Just imagine Black Susan, bigger than Jack and fiercer than Jack when he growls. Then she would be just like a panther. He settled Laura and Mary more comfortably on his knees and said, I'll tell you about Grandpa and the Panther. Your Grandpa? Laura asked. No, Laura, your Grandpa, my father. Oh, Laura said, and she wriggled closer against Pa's arms. She knew her Grandpa. He lived far away in the big woods in a big log house. Pa began, the story of Grandpa and the Panther. Your Grandpa went to town one day and was st late starting home. It was dark when he came riding his horse through the big woods, so dark that he could hardly see the road. And when he heard a panther scream, he was frightened, for he had no gun. How does a panther scream, Laura asked. Like a woman, said Pa, like this. Then he screamed so that Laura and Mary shivered with terror. Ma jumped in her chair and said, Mercy, Charles. But Laura and Mary loved to be scared like that. The horse, with Grandpa on him, ran fast, for it was frightened too, but it could not get away from the panther. The panther followed through the dark woods. It was a hungry panther, and it came as fast as the horse could run. It screamed now on this side of the road, and now on the other side, and it was always close behind. Grandpa leaned forward in the saddle and urged the horse to run faster. The horse was running as fast as it could possibly run, and still the panther screamed close behind. Then Grandpa caught a glimpse of it as it leapt from treetop to treetop, almost overhead. It was a huge black panther leaping through the air like Black Susan leaping on a mouse. It was many, many times bigger than Black Susan. It was so big that if it leapt on Grandpa, it could kill him with its enormous slashing claws and its long, sharp teeth. Grandpa on his horse was running away from it just as a mouse runs from a cat. The panther did not scream anymore. Grandpa did not see it anymore. 
but he knew that it was coming, leaping after him in the dark woods behind him. The horse ran with all its might. At last, the horse ran up to Grandpa's house. Grandpa saw the panther springing. Grandpa jumped off the horse against the door, and he burst through the door and slammed it behind him. The panther landed on the horse's back, just where Grandpa had been. Oh my goodness. Here he is racing through the woods on his horse and the panther looping behind him. So he got to the house. The horse screamed terribly and ran. He was running away into the big woods with the panther riding on his back and ripping his back with its claws. But grandpa grabbed his gun from the wall and got to the window just in time to shoot the panther dead. Grandpa said he would never again go into the big woods without a gun. When Pa told this story, Laura and Mary shivered and snuggled closer to him. They were safe and snug on his knees with his strong arms around him, around them. They liked to be there before the warm fire with Black Susan purring on the hearth and good dog Jack stretched out beside her. When they heard a wolf howl, Jack's head lifted and the hairs rose stiff along his back. But Laura and Mary listened to that lonely sound in the dark and the cold of the big woods. And they were not afraid. They were cozy and comfortable in their little house made of logs with the snow drifted around it and the wind crying because it could not get in by the fire. <laughs> that is the end of chapter two for today. I hope you guys have a great weekend and we'll look forward to reading chapter three to you on Monday. Bye.